Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. So I think my, I'm mic'd, right? So that's great. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation to be the closing speaker for this amazing two-day international conference that looks at uh, career and life transitions in uh, dance and sport. It looked like a phenomenal program. Um, you've heard personal stories. You've looked at and explored various career development theories and approaches. You've heard from experts in all kinds of different fields. And you've been finding common ground from which we can all move forward as a network. Um, for me, it's just amazing that we're even having this level of conversation in the first place. Um, I really want to salute uh, Amanda and Michael and Dr. Rolf and the organizing committee. And uh, let's give a big round of applause for making this happen. It's, it's really something. Um, I think that uh, everyone in this room, we're part of sort of a pioneering conference looking at these issues from different perspectives. When I was competing, this kind of discussion did not happen at all. Albeit it was 24 years ago. Huh? Okay, but, but, but um, you know, nobody wanted to talk about this stuff, even though it existed then as it exists today. Exists today. And I remember there was this incredibly kind, thoughtful, literally gentle man that was the team lead in the sport of sailing. And in 1993, one of his athletes committed suicide from post-Olympic depression. And it was the first time that it forced the Canadian Olympic Association, it was called at that time, to kind of uh, look at some of these issues. He knew that I was struggling as well at that time. It was a year after I had retired from sport. And so it brought us together. Um, but people didn't really want to talk about it, to be honest. Um, we were given 15 minutes, there was lip service, but nothing really significant happened at that juncture. And I think that when there isn't even a conversation, then things never change. If you can't talk about it, it doesn't exist and nothing ever moves forward. And I also believe that before something becomes a non-issue, it has to be an issue for a while. So it's wonderful that we're taking this issue on and treating it and talking about it in such a serious way. And it's why I think LEAP is so important. And I sure hope years four, five, and six get in place for funding as well. Um, even though I was only here this afternoon, I apologize, I was, I was in Vancouver yesterday. It's been so interesting to hear the dialogue and conversation. And I appreciate that while each of our transitions are so unique, there's so many commonalities, as I think there are between athletes and dancers. Um, we're physical. I, I loved uh, Jennifer Bolt's talk about movement and transition being about movement. Um, we're driven by passion, if not dollars. <laughs> uh, um, we don't need much, though. I think that's the cool thing. We know the real value of life, and it comes from experience and community and being able to express ourselves. Um, I think that also, as explored in this conference, we're all challenged on how to transfer what we know and love into different parts of our lives. And each story in each of us is different. I think some of us are able to stay in our own worlds. And, and um, Peggy talked about this. You know, in sport, sometimes we'll stay within the milieu of sport and become coaches or trainers or physios or work as an administrator for a sport association. In dance, the good Peggy, you know, 25 years, artist in residence still teaching that wonderful group. That's such a cool thing that you're getting older, but they stay the same. Is that great? Uh, I've got a really great friend, um, Graham, in Calgary, who's, who's a dancer. And you know, he had a remarkable career. He was 40 years as a modern dancer. And then in his 40s, he was brought over to Japan to teach for three years. And now he's the, um, I've got to get his title right, the, the director of modern dance at the Alberta Ballet School uh, in his 50s. So he's found a way to still stay in, in the world of dance, artistic directors, all sorts of ways to do that. Um, many people leave the field, though, and become graphic designers or doctors or entrepreneurs or, God help them, Bay Street lawyers. <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> but all, <laughs> Sandy Goss. <laughs> no, no, not Bay Street lawyer investors. Um, but all share, we all share the same challenge, regardless of, of how do we move from here to there and continue to thrive. So each of us has our own journey, um, and, and each one is unique, but I'd really like to share a little bit of mine today, just to give a context. So my, my journey has to, I think, start back when I was a swimmer, to give you a little bit of context. So 
Um, I swam in an era, I was sort of hitting my prime around 1984, 85. I was on the national team for about three years leading up to the 88 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. In 1987, I was the second best swimmer in the world in my event, the 100 meter backstroke. So I was a real medal favorite going into my first Olympics. And then something really wonky happened. Uh, the rules changed in my event. So a very smart American swimmer and Japanese swimmer both realized that in the rules for the 100 meter backstroke, we start in the water and go in, and we used to do flutter kick to come up to the surface, but there was nothing in the rules that said when you had to actually come up. They discovered, one of them was studying marine biology, that the dolphin kick is the fastest way to move through water. So they perfected this dolphin kick off the start and swam 48 meters underwater, did a flip turn and swam 48 meters underwater and hit the wall and smashed the world record. So my world ranking went from second to third to fifth to seventh by the time I got to the Olympics. I had a feeling that I needed to adapt to learn this, but I had a very, very autocratic swimming coach. He was terrific. He taught me excellent skill, but it was a very much being told what to do. And I, I think of a military background. And he was a British drill sergeant in the Navy. So <laughs> there's a reason I think of the military background. So he brought that to the pool. And there was no negotiating. You know, I remember swimming for four hours in a session once and being so exhausted and saying, Derek, I'm so tired. Please, can we stop? You're not tired. I'm tired. No, you're not tired. OK, I'm not tired. <laughs> you know, like surrender to this sort of attitude. Um, I, I went to the games. And it didn't go well. I came fifth. I didn't do a personal best. I felt like at the most important moment of my life, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I didn't feel very good about it. I left the games, thankfully, very lucky that I joined a relay team and I left with a silver medal. But no question, I was kind of the weakest link on that relay. So I left with a medal, but really disappointed and feeling a bit lost, not sure about what I was going to do next. The interesting thing about sport is we don't get a next season. We get four more years till the next Olympic Games. And that's a really big chunk of life and a big commitment. So I remember going back, and, and I just have to give a little context to our international guests and younger friends who might not remember this, but it was also the Games where Canada won the premier event, the 100 meter dash with Ben Johnson. And then it was taken away because he was caught for steroids. And we were so naive as a country, I believe, um, I remember a reporter saying, did you hear what happened to Ben? And I was like, what, did he get hit by a car? Like, what happened? <laughs> like, steroids were the last thing on my mind. And so it was a real shock to the Canadian sports system in general. And I remember arriving home to this gray cloud over Olympism in Canada, which added to the gray cloud of what next and feeling lost. And literally, I was, I was, uh, my mom and dad had a little party for me, and my mom is like Martha Stewart. She made all these little <laughs> olives with uh, cheese things that she cooks in the oven, and they puff, and they're just gorgeous. And I remember being depressed. I took all the leftovers and the leftover sparkly wine, and I was literally sitting on my couch at home, eating the bonbons and drinking sparkly wine and think, watching The Godfather 1, 2, and 3. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? Where do I go from here? And the phone rang. And it was somebody from the Alberta Sport Council offering me a Toastmaster speaking course for two days on the weekend. And I said, I was kind of open-minded. I had nothing else going on. The Seoul Olympics also ended in September, October. So we missed that semester of university or school or whatever it was you were in. So I also literally had time on my hands. So I took this course. Um, wasn't that exceptional for sure. It was probably, there were 12 of us that, you know, probably seven people, the teacher would have ranked higher than me at that moment. But I was the one that decided, I'm going to put this skill into action. And what I started to do was, because there was this dark cloud of Olympism in Canada, I started to go speak to school kids. And I'd speak to three schools a day, three times a week. And over the course of the fall, I spoke to over 40,000 grades, four to six students across the, uh, the province of Alberta. And it was amazing because I, I focused, I mean, it was like show and tell. I was like, how big do you think my bathing suit was? And you know, the grade four was, ah, and the thing is a little tiny thing. Here's the medal, oh, yeah, I just like, whatever. But, but, uh, but actually, in the process of doing that, I talked myself back into swimming because I was like, this thing sounds fantastic. <laughs> and so, 
And little did I know that that was actually the birth of what would become a career for me. Um, but it was very healthy because I didn't stop speaking when I went back to school, when I went back to uh, swimming, and I also kept my schooling going. So I had a bunch of things going, even though swimming was the big focus of my life. I learned something really important in that time in that um, I also received a scholarship, the Dale Carnegie School of Training of, of Speaking, um, heard what I was doing, giving all of this, these speeches to school kids. So they offered me a free scholarship to take their 14-week public speaking course. And Dale Carnegie's philosophy is you've earned the right to share your story. No one else knows your story. You're uniquely positioned to share that. And that really struck with me and, and was sort of one of my main models and, and still is today. I share this story because my life is kind of cyclical. And it's, it's just interesting how it works. Many things never happened how I expected the first time through. But in sticking with it, things happen the second time through, learning from what didn't work the first time. And I think that just inherent in all of us, coming from the worlds of dance or sport, is that we have the wherewithal to keep going often and to persevere. And some of those fundamental skills that while we're trying to figure things out, we don't realize just the process of figuring out is a skill in and of itself. In 1991, I'll fast forward to the next Olympic cycle. A year and a half before the Olympics, I had a big breakthrough, and ta-da, I was ranked second in the world again. Um, after the Olympics in Seoul, the International Swimming Federation changed the rules for the 100-meter backstroke, so you had to come up at 15 meters because it was too dangerous to have kids trying to swim underwater for, you can imagine, you know, eight and 10 year olds trying to, to mimic that. So they changed the rules, which was in my favor because I was still uh, on the water backstroke swimmer. Um, but again, life repeated itself. About 11 months before the Olympics, the world record holder, a swimmer from the United States, smashed the world record and dropped 1.2 seconds from the time that we had swam at the World Championships and put me you know, it took me seven years to make a 1.2 second drop from 16 to 23, and now I had 11 months to go. The difference this time was I decided to be self-reliant. My coach wanted to keep doing things the same way as he had done before Seoul, but I realized after my first Olympics, I had to live with that outcome for the rest of my life, and I didn't feel like I was a part of the process. So if I was going to live with the outcome after Barcelona, whatever it was, I needed to step up. So I was kind of lucky in that circumstance forced me to take that kind of leadership in my own career and my own journey at that moment in time. I decided that I had to do something really radical and it's why I think this is so cool, this collaborative effort that's here because Sometimes when we're in our own world, we're so siloed, we just miss so many opportunities. We don't, we're not objective anymore to different points of view. But I realized the weakest part of my swim was still the start and the turn. And even though it was only 15 meters, that's 30 meters of a 100 meter backstroke. That's 30% of a race. I trained after the synchronized swimming team, all women, masters at what they do, and I just got to give a shout out for synchronized swimming. It's kind of the closest thing to dance I think we have in, in the water for sure and in a lot of ways in sport. And synchronized swimming is a crazy sport where you know, you're holding your breath for close to a minute. So you feel like drowning after about 30 seconds. So you're fighting that urge to breathe underwater upside down. You're doing it while exerting the same energy as running the 400 meter dash. You're in perfect sync with seven other people. And then whenever you pop up, you smile, like you're in no pain, and you go down and like, it's crazy. It's just crazy sport. So, but I always loved the synchronized swimming team. And, and so, as fate would have it, I was just at a wedding, at a, you know, in a room like this with rounds, and, and a swimmer, it was a, a real sport industry wedding, a synchronized swimmer married a volleyball player in Calgary, so everybody was there. And I was dreading it because it was right after Jeff Rouse, that was my American counter, my competitor, had broken the world record. And you know, everybody knows what's going on with everybody else. And I, you know, it's like if you get a bad review, you don't want to go see all your, your colleagues, right? You're like, oh yeah, I know. So I didn't want everyone to go, oh, I heard about the world record. And so I, I arrived and, and at the wedding was the greatest coach of synchronized swimming in its history at that point, Debbie Muir. And she lived in my city. And I just happened to sit down and she said, how are things going? 
And instead of saying, oh, it's great, I, I just laid it out. I said, haven't you heard? Jeff broke the world record. I don't know what to do. And she finally said, we're at a wedding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> we got together for lunch and the next week. And, and she started to ask me questions. She just said, you know, have you ever worked on holding your breath underwater? No. Have you ever worked on the transition from underwater to, no. All these things. I said, no. And I realized, even though I'm swimming up to six hours a day, I'm seeing this world of possibility of things I have never thought of working on before. So maybe there's hope. And I clung on to that. At the end of our lunch, I said to Debbie, will you coach me? She actually was retired. She went into retirement. And I said, will you come out of retirement and coach me? I said, first of all, I just have to tell you a caveat. First of all, I can't pay you. I'm making $450 a month as a top-ranked swimmer. Go Canada, go. <laughs> it's changed a lot. I said, second time, I don't know where we're going to find it. I'm already swimming, you know, six hours a day sometimes. And third, I don't think I'll have any support. I don't think my coach will support this, and I certainly can't let my teammates find out or I'm dead. Like, hi, Mark. <laughs> so, I don't know. And she said, she said, no problem. No problem with no money and no problem with time. We'll make it work. But you have to, I, I can't coach you without your coach knowing about it. I just, with integrity as a coach, I can't do that. And I remember that was one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had, sitting down with my, my swimming coach in his 60s, totally close-minded guy to this kind of different, innovative thing, and just saying, I want to work with a synchronized swimming coach. He didn't support it, but he didn't stop me. So he said, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to hear about it. I will stop it if I feel like it's interfering with the training that we're doing. But if you feel like it's going to work, I can't stop you. And so I started to work with Debbie. And it was an amazing experience. Um, she brought a technical expertise that I had never thought about before. But as we started to work together, why it worked so interestingly was because we were peers in a way. Even though she was a, a world-class coach and I wasn't a coach in, in any way yet, I was the expert in swimming, and she was the expert in synchro. And we had to find a way for those two worlds to come together. So she couldn't do what she did without me sharing information about what I did. And so this amazing partnership and friendship started to form between me and this remarkable female coach. It was also a different kind of world. You know, instead of being told how to feel, I never forget the first day Debbie said, so how did that feel? And I thought she said, you know, how do you feel? And I was like, 20 years of therapy. I was like, you want to know how I feel? I'm so frustrated. She's like, oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> but she was used to calibrating, as you would in dance. You try something, and then you, how did that feel? What was that like? You adjust based on that feeling. And so we brought that into the pool. But something else started to happen. We started to become terrific friends. And we became so close that at a certain point, I realized I have to share something with her. We talked about identity today a lot. And part of my identity was Olympian and swimmer, but there was this closeted identity as gay guy in a very non-gay world. Calgary, Alberta, the swimming pool, British, like it's as non-gay as it gets. And, and I struggled with that. And I didn't know how to acknowledge and honor that. And I just kept pushing it down. And I think it's kind of easy to do. And I'm going to use my example of gay. But I think every one of us has issues. And, and it's whatever it is. But it's easy when we're in that intensity of high performance not to deal with some of those things that make us human, some of our foibles or some of our quirks or some of our personality traits that make us who we are. It's easy to ignore that and just become the homogenized, I'm an Olympic swimmer, I'm an Olympic swimmer. I knew that I was at this juncture with this friend that if I wasn't honest, it would ruin the friendship because she would always wonder why I felt I couldn't trust her to share this piece of information. And it was one of the most amazing things. I went out for dinner with her to Earl's, just for the record, just a, a little eatery in Calgary. And Debbie was kind of, it's funny. I mean, I know I whispered it, but I think she's also kind of deaf from also ye you know, yelling at the pool, one, two, three, four, one, two, and the music. And so I remember, you know, I never said these words out loud to anybody, let alone an adult. And I said, you know, Debbie, 
I'm gay. And she's like, what? <laughs> like, I'm gay. And it was like, gay, gay, gay. <laughs> and, and I never shared that because I, I didn't want to be rejected by my team. I didn't want my coach to stop coaching me. I didn't want to lose my livelihood. I didn't want to get beat up by the football players and the soccer players and the wrestlers that we shared a locker room with every day. And as it hit Debbie, she kind of recoiled and teared up. And I thought, oh my God, just I, what's, you know, I've lost her. And she just took a second to compose herself. And she said, you, I can't imagine how hard it's been for you. You have me 110% and we're going to win these bloody Olympics. And she was my, my safety place and the little place to start for that part of my identity to come out, but an extraordinarily powerful one. How can you be the best in the world at what you're doing if there's such inner conflict and turmoil? How can you... I, I had to reconcile that. And by telling Debbie, all of that energy that used to go like that went into the external goal of trying to win the Olympic Games. I had a really horrible thing happen. In, I, I've always been like this, like, you know, energetic and enthusiastic. So grade seven, it wasn't so cool. It was pretty easy to see I was the gay kid. And I had the fag in the locker in grade eight that followed me through grade nine, 10, 11, 12. I hated school, just went as much as I had to to get my grades. Swimming, even though I was the same bundle of wackiness <laughs> and me, um, I saw that excellence is a great deterrent against discrimination. And because I was good at what I did, people kind of looked the other way, never talked about it, and I was accepted. So that was my safe haven. But there was a moment, the very end of my career, I'm in the ready room. So in swimming, in the morning, you, you qualify for the final. Then at night, you have to go for the last 30 minutes to this thing called the ready room and you sit there for 30 minutes with your seven other competitors. And there's nothing to do but wait, and it's super intense. And God bless you guys from the United States, you always have such depth of field. You know, the two Americans are like talking about you, oh, Tewksbury doesn't look good. I'm like, really, I can hear you, like it's not working, whatever, like all, all this going on. But I really, I looked around that room, and there was the best swimmer from Spain and Cuba and Germany and Britain and all over the place. We've all trained thousands and thousands of hours to get here. We all want to win this bloody race. But I thought, what makes me different? And in the best way possible, I thought to myself, I'm the fag. <laughs> really? And it was like, <laughs> I felt this like tingling. And what had been, what had been a liability for so much of my athletic career in that moment turned into my greatest asset. I went out there to swim, and I just thought, for the hell of it, I'll show you what happened. So here's what happened in the race. Surprise. <laughs> and now, the hopes of Canada, the man from Calgary. A 24-year-old. He says he is a player now. I'll just say it's a good thing I could not hear the announcers for the record. In lane six, Zubero is in the building. Lane one's at the bottom of the picture, so Tewksbury is the fifth one up. He's not wearing a bathing cap. Jeff Rouse, the world record holder, is this side of him. The Spaniard Zubero is on the other side on the top, lane number six. It's two lengths of the pool. Jeff Rouse has a phenomenal start in lane four. Mark will be behind and have to play catch up. Thanks. Mark flings himself. The swimmers can stay in for 15 meters. Let's see who pops up first. It is Rouse. Tewksbury's got himself a good start. He likes to play catch up. He has to because of the start that Rouse has. World record is 53.93. The split is 25.90. Let's watch as they get to the first turn. 50 meters in to the 100 meter backstroke. Mark looks very good right now. He's made up almost all of that ground. He touches in second place. He's ahead of the other American. A little bit weak off the turn there, as you notice. Again, Rouse has phenomenal turning ability. He's out in front. Mark has to play catch up again, but he's good at that. He's got to pick it up right now. Here we are, 25 meters left. The men's 100 meter backstroke. It is between Rouse and Tewksbury. Here comes Mark Tewksbury to the final five meters. 
House and Tewksbury. It's going to go to the wall and on the wall. <laughs> Dan Smith, he's done it. Olympic record. The Dream Lamb. That's perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so, just for the record, my best time is 55.29, 53.98. I dropped 1.3 seconds, thanks to Debbie, I say it. And um, I beat Jeff Rose, the world record, by six one hundredths of a second, which is what he beat me by a year and a half earlier. So I was like, e anyways, I'm really excited. Um, so, um, I actually just got my gold medal back. It has spent the last year and a half in the Canadian Museum for Human Rights as an exhibit for the year in sport because I claim that medal as much a human rights medal as an Olympic medal because of Debbie. Because one person created an environment for me to be my whole self, my entire identity. And that was what enabled me to win. And as awful as that year before the Olympics was, where Jeff broke the world record and it turned out to be the best moment in my life for meeting Debbie, I think that what appeared to be the greatest moment of my life winning the Olympics turned out to be one of the hardest, I don't want to say worst, because I'm glad it happened, but it was extremely difficult. Because I won Canada's first gold medal after Ben Johnson. So Ben was the first gold in Seoul, I'm the first gold in Barcelona. So bad, bad Ben, perfect, perfect Mark. But Mark's got a little secret, big secret. And suddenly where Debbie had created that space for that identity to live, the new reality, cover appearance on Time Magazine, book, line of clothing at Sears, changed everything. There was a morality clause in every contract I signed. How do I tell my agent I'm gay? How do I say, no, I, I can't take that contract because I know I won the Olympics, but I'm not who you think I am? And I started to feel like a fraud. And I started to feel extremely, extremely depressed and, and conflicted. Because on one hand, I was this, peop this person people thought I was. I did achieve that. But on the other hand, I'd always think to myself, if only you knew who I really was. And it stopped me. That thought stopped me from allowing any emotion in, any love in. I just became a bundle of an abyss of darkness and self-loathing and hate. I also stopped swimming, which at that time, we didn't have the discussions about maybe training an extra year to say goodbye to your team, to start to create new networks. It was cold turkey, so I lost my network. I was traveling all the time, staying in hotel rooms, isolated. And what's on worse, I'm a privileged guy. I, I won the Olympics. So I would try to talk to people about the challenges I had, and they'd be like, oh, shut up. You're the one that made it. You're the one that, so there was no room. There was no validation of this challenge. And my world got extraordinarily dark. Um, I, I don't exaggerate that I thought about killing myself every single day. It just was my go-to, my easy way out. Of course, I would never act on that really and take my life, but it was the thought. It was like, how can I escape this hell? One day out of the blue, I went to see this premiere of a movie called I, Tina, which was on, oh no, What's Love Got To Do With It? Sorry, the book was I, Tina. It's What's Love Got To Do With It, about Tina Turner. And she was getting the shit beat out of her by her husband, Ike Turner, and he was, you know, she was, had a horrible life. And she walked out of the limousine one day, said, fuck you, and I'm gonna start my life over and do it on my terms as my name. And I left that theater going, I, Tina, I, Tina. Like, that was my mantra. I was like, I found my way. And my point here is that sometimes when we're struggling, just like Peggy talked about finding all of these examples outside of the traditional realm of dance, things can inspire us or help us with our identity or help find the way in the most unlikely of places when we're open to it. And so after I saw that, a week later, I was speaking somewhere, and I met the Consul General of Australia. And I asked what it takes to become an Australian. And he said, well, you've won the Olympics. We're hosting Olympics in 2000. You'd be a great candidate for permanent residency. So I applied, 
And within three months, I got accepted and I bought a one-way ticket to Australia to get away from this world that I knew where I felt so dark and imprisoned and left it all behind. Everyone thought I was crazy because I couldn't give the real full reason to everybody. My agent thought, like, what are you doing? You'll never, you're like, this is just makes no sense. But it was my only way out, my only way to save myself, the road less traveled. The greatest thing about there was I went back to school, first of all. I went to university. I studied political science. And there were courses like sex and politics and gender identity. And I learned the language of how I felt and masculinity versus femininity, all these fantastic scholars. And, and it empowered me because it helped me start to sort things out and understand who I was. I found the language, the theory, to bring my feelings to validate how I was and who I was. But I also did something really interesting. I dove into the gay community. I was surrounded by only gay people for a while. And that wasn't good either, because it was, that wasn't just who I was. And it was a great lesson in integrating and understanding that we're not just a silo, no matter who we are. We have to broaden that. So all of these things started to go on. I, I think this conference is so important, because what I've heard today is the language, the theories, the process about transition. And it just helps us all understand it and validate wherever we are on that journey. And without that, it can be a really, really dark time, but instead it becomes extremely powerful. So I finished my university in Australia, and I was brought back to Canada um, to be part of the sport world. It's a whole other story. It didn't work out. Um, to be like part of the International Olympic Committee. <laughs> That's really a whole other story of corruption and oh my God. Anyway, um, but I started my speaking career again and, and it was very difficult because now I was an empowered, aware, fulfilled person plunked back into my environment where people don't know yet. And I had this uh, for about a year before I finally decided. It was December 15th, 1998. When I came out, um, it was on the front page of the Global Mail. It became the story of the day. I had 110 f uh, interviews for media within the first hour of it breaking. It became this huge story. I didn't ever imagine that my private life would become so public, nor did I ever want it to. It wasn't an act of courage. It was an act of survival. But it was finally where my world started to fully integrate, started to. Because I thought by coming out, be done, nice and neat, and all is good now. I didn't realize it was the, the beginning of a, of a much longer process, which is like any transition. It doesn't happen just like that. Just like winning the Olympics didn't happen like that, or your dance career didn't happen like that. It's a process. I kept trying to speak more and build this business, but I kept feeling this block. People wanted me to write a book to distill my experience and expertise. And for six years, I tried to write that book, and I couldn't write it. And finally, I woke up one day and realized I'm trying to write the wrong book. I've got to sh share the gay narrative arc first, because that's the part of my identity that's been the most dark and hidden. And so I sat down in 2005, and within four and a half weeks, wrote Inside Out Straight Talk from a Gay Jock. I love that title. That's my title. Anyway, so. <laughs> and, and it got it out of the way. It got it out of the way, and the story was told. Um, funny enough, you know, after all of that, that book came out. I thought when I wrote that book that I may not be doing corporate work anymore because Corporate Canada may not to hear, want to hear from me anymore. Um, I thought I'd do a tour, do like a one-man show like Margaret Cho was doing down in the States. And as soon as the book was written, I felt like I had nothing left to say. It was like, that was the sort of end of that, not end of that chapter, but it was the end of me being tortured in that darkness. And it was all out. And funny enough, that book that it, people wanted me to write for six years and I couldn't, came within a year, called The Great Traits of Champions. And it basically distilled all of my experience in achievement, leadership, and the idea of legacy into 24 modules that to this day 
uh, nine years later, is still the base of my business. And guess who my business partner is? Debbie Muir, the synchronized swimming coach. So talk about life coming for me full circle in a way that I would have never imagined. It's taken eight years to get our business to where it is, which is maybe we're trying to scale ourselves so we don't have to tra travel all the time. We're trying to move into the digital uh, world of learning, which is extraordinarily difficult. I've received more rejections and no's and objections to every corporation. You know, this is a great thing. Oh, well, no, we, we're not that management system. Or, oh, what about the security? Or, oh, like there's, everyone has an objection. But it reminds me of the sport path that those skills that enable us to succeed in dancing, in life, in sport, also do translate. And of course, I believe they translate because I've distilled a book and, and they're making a living on it. I think it's, it's that, that clear. But I also realize that it's not easy in life, no matter what it is that we're doing. And I think sometimes we forget as we transition and we leave from a peak of something that we want to jump to another peak. And we forget to whoop, that, that slide back down to starting from a, a different base to build back up. I flew in here from Vancouver because I was at my first ever trade show, working a trade show at a medical conference standing there for eight hours showing our little demo of the video and talking to people and just reminded of the goal, the distance and the exhaustion and what it takes to succeed again. And I don't even know if we will yet, but it's certainly worth the effort. <sighs> Movement, evolution. It's so exciting to see the kind of progress that's happened around issues of transition in sport, and dance, of course. I know, I think that you guys are way ahead of us though, because the DTRC has been around for 30 years. And hats, you know, salute to you and, and, and your founder. Yay! Thank you. Um, but, but, you know, I, I was reminded just this week Cassie Campbell um, is a hockey player from Canada. She was one of our stars. She was the uh, uh, captain of the team in 2002 when we won the gold medal in Salt Lake City. And she posted a picture of us in Lake Louise, there's six of us, and she said, do you remember the first Olympic Excellence Series? And it was when the Olympic Committee started to realize that success would come from the Olympic team before the games by bringing the sports together and breaking down the silos and starting to create an environment of one unified Canadian team. It would take a few cycles for that to actually really happen. But the, the idea started in 2006, and along with that, came a post-Olympic excellence series where the team came together after the Olympics for one last time. The Olympics are crazy because you become a team the day of the Olympics, or actually it's about a week before that the site selection commission uh, names the team. The minute the games are done, the team is over. That's it. And it's a very um, nebulous thing. It, it exists for three weeks. And so the post-Olympic excellence series at least devoted a couple hours, part of the day, to talking about transition but just getting the conversation started. I really have to uh, salute uh, Jeremiah, who's here, who's working with Game Plan, the Canadian Sport Institutes, who are well represented um, from all parts of Icar and, and Judy and, and, and Rolf, all, all across this country, that are, and, and Andre Ann, that have really taken this issue and made sure that it goes the next place. And I think the Game Plan, as you heard early in this conference, is sort of already Game Plan 2.0 from where it was when we first started thinking about this. But now, the DRTC and sport and game plan coming together gives us new insights and takes it even further, which I find so exciting. The conversation is changing. I was the head of the Olympic team, chef de mission in London 2012. I'm blessed to still be in touch with the athletes. They know me, I know them, they talk to me. I just saw Rosie McLennan, she's our trampoline athlete that won in 2012 and 2016, one of the few Canadian athletes to defend an Olympic gold. And she's of the wherewithal to understand that she might be retiring, but she needs to take some time. She needs to ease herself out of her sport. She's gonna do the World Cup circuit for a year to see how she feels. She's gonna finish doing her degree at university that takes the priority while sport takes a second place. But she knows not to just drop one for the other at this moment to find a way to sort of ease herself out of this whole experience. I met a fencer, Joseph, who's really struggling 
that understands his dream of going for one more Olympics as a fencer is still strong, but he's already put on hold a career opportunity at Bell Canada for three years while they waited for him to sort of mentor the leaders and be in a really intense leadership development course for three months. So he's chosen short term to go with Bell and he's wrestling with that, but at least he's able to go to people to have the conversation and to think about it and approach it in a really, really thoughtful way. That heightened awareness is so important. I think that awareness is so curative in so many different ways. Surprisingly, and I'm not gonna share their names, but there's some icons in sport that I'm seeing going through really tough periods right now. I've been at a number of events over the past couple weeks. And, and one young man, I've just seen him kind of like borderline drunk at each event. That's usually a pillar of our community. And it makes my little red flag or yellow flag go up and just have an eye on him. Just know that you know I will reach out to make sure that he's okay. And again, that's awareness. And if we weren't here having these kind of conversations, we wouldn't be aware of what's going on in the world around us. As I said earlier, sometimes before something's a non-issue, it has to be an issue, which transition from a high performance life still is, which is why I'm so proud to be here closing this conference. The level of conversation awareness, sharing of knowledge is remarkable. I think that Leap Conference, you've actually raised the bar so much higher. And I can't wait to see where it keeps going. And so thoughtful. You know, we don't just leave here with nothing. You've already brainstormed of next steps and how do we keep that network going. As you leave, I would like you to remember that all of us have a responsibility to keep this going. Please remember the environment that Debbie created for me that we can create for other people. One person has the power to create a space to make such a huge difference for other people. If every single one of us in this room keeps doing that, look at how much it expen exponentiates. Somebody has to figure out this transition from high performance life to everyday great next life. Why not us? Why not you? Thank you for your time. Thank <laughs> you.